call the foreign reporter. What was that? Oh, and so we're now recording. Uh, and I'm Connie Nestor. I've had the distinct pleasure of chairing the Scottish American History Forum these last 10 years. And I want to wish you all a hearty welcome this morning. And to my right is Jack Sanders, and he is with Chicago Scots. And we are together in uh, the Scottish home in the Heritage Hall this morning. So the campus is beginning to open up and we're hoping to be able to convene events here again in the near future. We're very excited. Um, for anyone on the, the teams this morning that isn't aware, the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots, formerly the Illinois St. Andrew Society, which uh, founded in 1845 the oldest 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois. And the Caledonia Senior Living uh, and Memory Care Campus is located in North Riverside, Illinois, which is where Jack and I are. Chicago Scots is dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of the Scottish culture, in addition to supporting Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. And so for additional information, please check our website, www.chicagoscots.org. And we hope everyone will please give generously to our charity. But um, now, um, I, I, we were planning to have our president, Gus Noble, speak. Is he here? Yep. Oh, how come I don't see him? He's driving. Oh, I see. So Gus, Gus is on the phone with us this morning, all the way from Scotland, where he's been uh, visiting his family there. Gus, we're, we're very concerned about your father, and I can't tell you how heartfelt it is to have you join us under those conditions. But Gus, we'd love to hear how you're doing and, and uh, have an update from you this morning, please. Thank you, Connie. I, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm actually driving from uh, Newcastle uh, back up to Edinburgh. I've been visiting some family down in Newcastle and I'm um, on my way to the hospital and, uh, to visit my father. So I've just driven through the beautiful border country where uh, my home in Duns uh, passed in the, the, uh, the window. And I'm sending you my best regards from, from the borders. Is your dad doing okay, Gus? Uh, he's having a good day today, yes. He's, oh, okay. he's really been through some uh, challenging days. And uh, what the future looks like, we don't know. But I appreciate everyone's best wishes and prayers. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Well, God bless where you are all in our prayers, especially your father. So thank you so much, Gus, for calling in. Well, um, I think we'll go ahead and uh, begin our presentation this morning. And Bruce, we're so tremendously pleased to have you with us. Bruce is back by popular demand. Dr. Bruce Allardyce, JD, Instructor, Social and Behavioral Science, History, Political Science at South Suburban College in South Holland, Illinois. And Professor Allardyce is going to speak to us on Border Reavers, the Unknown Clans of the Lowlands. So Bruce, before you begin, Jack's Sydney, going to go ahead and explain. There's some the big sign in the way of the meeting this morning. Thank you, Connie. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Bruce is going to give his presentation, and then we'll have a Q&A portion at the end. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to turn off their uh, <clears throat> their videos and mute now so that we can let Professor Allardyce start his presentation. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Have you made me the uh, co-host as of now? Yep, you're okay. Looking. We'll go ahead then. Yeah. Uh, something for a second here. There we go. Uh, yeah, good here. Uh, there we go. Uh, 
Okay, can everyone see the screen first off? Yes, looks good. Okay, then I'll go to uh, Oh, my talk today is entitled The Border Reavers, Scotland's Border Clans. Uh, the, la the logo you see there, by the way, is the uh, logo of the Iowa Western Community College football team, which for some strange reason is nicknamed the Reavers. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about the Reavers, the border clans, focusing mostly on the golden age of the Reavers, which was in the 1500s and early 1600s. And then some touching on what the borders are like today. Now to start out with, I am not descended from a border family myself. My father's father came from Dundee in the northwest part of the country. But I do have a border connection in that during the First World War, he served in the King's own Scots borders. So I have a military connection, at least, to the borders. Well, to start out with, what is a border reaver? And what are the borders we're talking about? Well, first off, you may not be familiar with the word reaver. To reave is... Reaving is a noun. It actually comes from an ancient Middle English word that means to plunder or to rob. And I think that uh, the origin of the word gives you a hint of how the border people were looked upon at the time. The border we're talking about is, uh, you can see my pointer here, this area right here. It's the 96 mile line that separates England from Scotland. And while that border has changed in ancient times back and forth, basically for the last 450 years, it's where it is on the map and where it is today. The border reavers were raiders along the Anglo-Scottish border from the late 13th century to the uh, beginning of the 17th century. And they included both Scottish and English people. They raided across the entire border, often without regard to nationality. Their heyday, the most publicized period, was in the 1500s and early 1600s, uh, during the time when the House of Stuart was winding down and then became the ruling monarch family of the kings of England. And during the many wars that happened during this time, the livelihood of the people along the borders was constantly devastated by the contending armies. And even when the countries were not at war, formally, tensions remained high, and royal authority in either or both kingdoms was often weak on the borders, including, of course, the borders between England and Scotland. The difficulties and uncertainties of human survival meant that communities and or people kindred to each other would seek security through group strength and cunning. They would attempt to improve their livelihoods, mostly at their nominal enemy's expense. Enemies who were frequently just trying to survive themselves. Loyalty to a feeble or distant monarch and reliance on the effectiveness of the law usually made people a target for depredations rather than conferring any security. Now there were, now there were other factors that, uh, so we hit my forward button there. There were other factors that may have promoted uh, predatory mode of living in the borders. Um, most of England, for example, was under a law called primogeniture, where the, uh, if you had a farm or a land holding, the eldest son would inherit the entirety of the land holding. By contrast, along the borders, usually the land holdings were parceled up among the many children you had. So any one children might not be able to inherit enough land to have their own farm, essentially, or cattle ranch, I guess you'd call it. 
And so they'd have to turn to other means, let's put it that way, to uh, make a living. Also, most of, much of the border region is mountainous or open moorland. It's unsuitable to farming, but good for grazing. Livestock was easily rustled and driven away by mounted reavers who knew the country well. Now the mounted reavers might also steal household goods, valuables, or take prisoners for ransom. Now, what did the English and Scottish governments think about this? Well, it alternated, depending on the king and depending on the historical situation. They could be indulgent. They could even encourage these raids. Because for both sides, the fierce families on the border remained the first line of defense against invasion across the border. But of course, when kings like James V of Scotland wanted to assert their authority, uh, they could be incredibly ruthless about uh, punishing lawlessness. The Roy Deer's raiding activities were usually within a day's ride of the border. And they went both north and south. English raiders were reported to have hit the outskirts of Edinburgh at one point, and Scottish raids were often reaching Yorkshire or Lancashire. Now, the main raiding season was during the early winter months, when the nights were longest and the cattle and horses fat from having spent the summer grazing. The numbers involved in these raids might range from a few dozen to organized campaigns involving up to 3,000 riders. When raiding, or riding as it was termed, the Reavers rode light and hardy nags or ponies, renowned for their ability to pick their way across boggy moss grounds. The original dress of Shepherd's plaid was later replaced by a light armor and metal helmets, hence their nickname, the Steel Bonnets. And of course, that's the name of the George MacDonald Fraser book. They were usually armed with light lances and small shields, and sometimes also with long bows or light crossbows. And later on with one or more pistols. And they invariably carried swords or dirks. I'm going to stop this share for a second and hopefully share something else here. A little film clip. Uh, little film clip from a um, TV series called The Borders. Um, this is from 19 British television series from 1969. I guess just show you a few seconds of it. Uh, Bruce, we can't really hear it. Um, did you uh, click the share sound? Yeah, so these are sound problems. Yeah. Yeah. Did you uh, click the uh, share sound button? Hold on a second. Uh, evidently, my original share sound didn't go to the second share sound. So, uh, uh, um, you might have to stop sharing your screen and then. Yeah, I thought the original sound share would apply to the second sound share, but evidently not. Uh, okay, let's try this again then. There we go. Okay. Well, I'll give you an idea of it anyway. Don't worry about that. Uh, what you saw there, of course, was burning and lances and swords. And that's sort of the popular uh, vision or uh, belief of uh, border readers. And of course, again, there's much more to it than that. Yes, I wrote this week about who 
studio and situation in this set and described it as it's when the happy end is just the start. Um, so I got to definitely do something again here. Get that. Okay, back. Stop share here. Get back. Get back to my uh, thing here again. There we go. And yeah. Do you think these two people look alike? <laughs> well, my wife does, and uh, sort of interesting. To anyone familiar with border history, it's one of those photos that lets send a little shudder through the mind. In a moment. Thousands of miles away from Scotland's border regions, the threads come together. The two descendants of two notable Anglo-Scottish border families sitting together. Although the UK is one country today, the frontier line still exists between England and Scotland. Today, even more than in the past, the borderers are mixed in a racial sense, particularly on the English side. A good half of the residents of Carlisle, England are Scottish by ancestry. But more generally, the racial composition of the borderland has not altered that much. The Elliots and the Fenwicks, Bells and Nixons, Littles and Scots, Maxwells and Cars are still where they were in the 1500s. One can say that the borders, both sides of the frontier line, form a distinct and separate cultural and social block which is apart from the rest of British people. Now it is always dangerous to generalize about a region or a people, particularly about the differences between the borders and the rest of the UK. As one observer notes, quote, they are not to put it as tactfully as possible, the most immediately lovable fold in the United Kingdom. Incomers might think them difficult to know. There is a tendency among them to be suspicious and taciturn, and the harsh border accent lends itself readily to derision and complaint. But on the credit side, there is a border virtue, which on any human scale should outweigh the faults, and that is the ability to endure. For if there are qualities in the border people that make them less than amiable, it must be understood that they were shaped by the most continuous ordeal that has passed most of Britain's time. That ordeal reached its peak in the 1500s when great numbers of border people lived by despoiling each other. And when the great border tribes, both English and Scottish, feud, feuded constantly among themselves, where robbery and blackmail were everyday professions and where murder was part of the social system. The Anglo-Scottish frontier, short as it is, is and was a dividing line between two of the most energetic, aggressive, talented, and altogether formidable nations in human history. Perhaps the two nations could have been, lived side by side as peaceful neighbors, possibly, but not probably. They did live in peace for long periods of time and do today but it was not in the nature of either in the beast historically to stay quiet for very long. A small country such as Scotland that survives under the shadow of a dynamic and much larger country such as England becomes quite naturally suspicious, sensitive, and fiercely jealous as regards to its neighbor. It fears him, but cannot help imitating him and be drawn to him. King Henry VIII of England realized this when he observed that the larger inevitably draws the smaller. Nature divides the border into three regions, with which both sides designated marches, which is an old uh, Norman term, I believe, for frontier areas. Each country, each country's government appointed special wardens or sheriffs for each of their three regions. The wardens, usually popular local leaders, met with their cross-border counterparts once a month. At these so-called truce days, charges were made, subjects on each side extradited to their home country, and crimes of the Scots against the English and vice versa were roughly adjudicated. 
each government had a vested interest in this sort of rough, rough justice because otherwise unpunished cross-border ways raids could lead to full-scale war. It should be remembered that the border doesn't necessarily run east to west, but rather southwest to northeast. And indeed, there are sections of the border, for example, near Wark here, where one can travel due south from England and enter Scotland. On the Scottish side, the Hume family almost always held the wardenship of the middle of the Eastern March. In wartime, this was the natural path for an English invasion because um, armies then traveled on their stomach and lived off the land. And this is the most fertile ground of the three for invasions. The middle marches saw the most raids. Here, the Kurs or the Scots usually held the wardship. And the two families had a long running feud as, uh, as a consequence of their competition for the wardship. And in the West, the Maxwells and Johnstones had a similar feud. And this is perhaps the bloodiest feud in Scotland's history. More on the borders, the Scots were significantly outnumbered by the English. One estimate from the 1500s, and all we have is estimates because uh, there were no censuses at the time, posits there were about 50,000 borderers on the Scottish side, uh, facing 120,000 on the English side. The borderers made excellent soldiers for both sides, if disciplined, but that raw material was hard to tame. The Scottish middle march in particular proved so hard for the Scots government to control that King James V, who reigned from 1513 to 1542, he gave up trying to rule it and essentially asked the English a foreign policer, power to police the area instead. This is a picture of the land. The whole region contains some of the loveliest and some of the bleakest country in the British Isles. The Cheviot Hills in the middle are a rough barrier of desolate treetops and moorlands with little valleys and gullies running every which way. The hills are not high, but they are bleak and lonely beyond description. Just to the north of these hills are the Scottish Dales and the country of the Scott families with bright rivers and tree-lined meadows. One ancient chronicler called these dales, quote, the beautiful valleys filled with savages. That's the middle marches. On the east and west, there are coastal plains and good farmlands. And on the east and west sides are the only two cities of any size in the area, both now part of England, though certainly the 13, 1400s were under con uh, contest between the two countries. The old fortress of Carlisle in the west and the town of Barwick in the northeast. You may not be familiar with the border names, but here's some of them. Hepburn, Holm, Hume, Armstrong, Graham, Nixon, Rutherford, Trotter, Pringle, Carr. They had their own forenames and nicknames that are sometimes a little amusing. The trouble is the men of the same clan often born the first name. One census listed no less than 12 Hob Elliots in the same town. To differentiate them, one method was to combine the first name with that of their father. Thus, Christy Armstrong, son of William Armstrong, was known as Wills Christie. A second method was to call a man by his place or land, such as Kinmont Willie Armstrong, Hob of the Lays, or Sim the Laird. And a third method, one that evidently delighted the borderers, was to give the descriptive 
and often offensive nicknames to these people based on personal habits or appearance. Thus, we had fingerless Will Nixon, Skinnabake Armstrong, ill drowned Geordie Turnbull, Archie, fire the Bray's car, or sweet milk Scott. These are clans with tartans, just as much as the more publicized Highland clans, the Campbells, the Mackenzies, the Gordons, the Stewarts, the McPhersons, the McClouds, the McDonalds. And I can say this because an act of Scottish Parliament in 1587 describes, quote, the chieftains and chiefs of all clanists of the Highlands or borders. They just officially use the words clan and chief to describe both Highland and border families. And the act goes on to list the various border clans. So this has been given official recognition. The words chief or head, clan or family are interchangeable. It is therefore possible to talk about the McDonald family or clan or the Maxwell family or clan. The notion that Highlanders should be listed as clans while their Lowlanders are listed as families originated as a 19th century convention. English invasions of Scotland rarely reached as far north as the Highlands. It was thus the border clans and not the more celebrated Highland clans, they were the country's first line of defense. The usual invasion routes were along the East Coast here through Barrick and uh, Haddington to Edinburgh or up the Esk River Valley. Guerrilla, the guerrilla warfare was often the outnumbered Scots only option. While the English army invariably outnumbered the Scots army, its very size could be turned to its disadvantage. Medieval armies had primitive logistics. Supply wagons were few, and the armies, and particularly the horses, had to live off the land, eating grass or seized grain. Thus, the Scots' best and most effective defense, though perhaps not the most popular one, was a scorched earth policy. They destroyed their own homes and fields and took to the fields and forests with their beasts and all they could move, and carried on the struggle by ambush, cutting supply lines, constantly harrying English. This style of warfare was carried across the border into England as hungry Scots retaliated by raiding the more prosperous England. But of course, guerrilla warfare results in guerrilla living. In times of war, the border Scots became almost nomadic. They learned to live on the move to cut crop subsistence to a minimum and rely on the meat they could drive in front of them. They could build a house in a few hours and have no qualms about abandoning it. This guerrilla wartime lifestyle carried on to the so-called times of peace because the border was never really peaceful. For many, there was no future for a border trying to lead a settled existence, even the so-called peacetime. Why till crops when they might be stolen or burned before the harvest? Why build a house well when it might be looted the next week? From the 1300s to the 1600s, it was a system that was often one of armed plunder from the English, but quite often from their fellow Scots. Perhaps the best description of Scottish border life in the 1500s comes from a cleric, the Bishop of Ross, who wrote that the borders lived, quote, chiefly on flesh, milk, and boiled barley. Beef, mutton, and broth were the staples of the diet. Bread was a rare dainty. Hearth cakes of oats substituted for the bread. Wine and beer could be had in the towns, and the towns also contained the more substantial houses. In the countryside, the average dwelling was a mere hut flashing the 
fashioned of clay or stone with turf walls, reminiscent of the sod houses that the American pioneers of the West built. The inhabitants were little concerned that their hut was burned by raiders, as it often was, for in a few hours they could erect a new hut. The wealthier inhabitants constructed solid stone or wood houses that could, in a pinch, be defended. From this evolved the keel house or tower pictured above with massive stone walls, often three or four stories high. The only entrance to these was via an easily defensible double door. The bottom story was used for storage and the only way to get to the living quarters was, up, was via a narrow curving staircase, usually going up clockwise so the defendants had their Defenders had their unguarded left side nearest the wall with their right arm free to wield a sword, whereas the attackers had their right sword arm restricted by the wall. Tradition has it that the cars, who were often left-handed, built their stairs anti-clockwise. A left-handed person is still called cur handed at the borders, by the way. The upper floors contain narrow windows through which the defenders could shoot arrows or bullets, and a rooftop that could double as a beacon or watchtower. The border reaver often wore a leather shirt, often studded with iron nail for added protection. Leather boots and breeches completed the outfit, which was cheap, light, and serviceable, well suited to the cut and ran activities of the wearer. A simple iron helmet or bonnet afforded head protection. For weapons, the lance was the standard weapon, being convenient for use while riding. For long range action, the borders often preferred the bow and arrow as being cheaper and easier to maintain by the handgun. But by 1600, gunpowder pistols had largely superseded the bow. For close quarter fighting, swords were rare, carry but rare. More often, the reaver contained a Jedburg ax or a bill, a combination of cleaver or pike. Thus equipped, the reaver was uh, ready for his day's work. This is Tallow's Tower, and that's Johnny Armstrong's stronghold. The inhabitants of the border had to live in a state of constant alert. And for self-protection, if they could, they built fortified tower houses of various kinds. I won't go into the details of kinds. Here's a beautiful picture of the border reavers. He was a specialist and thus needed specialist equipment. The most important part of his equipment was his horse. Wrote Bishop Wesley, quote, they reckon it a great disgrace for anyone to make a journey on foot. The medieval chronicler Froissart, a Frenchman, noted that the Scots of war, quote, are all a horseback, the common people on little hackneys and geldings. Scotland so valued its horses that its parliament often passed legislation banning the export of horses. We don't have a huge statistical record of raids, but in the early 1580s, the Elliott clan actually kept a record of their raids for some reason. Uh, the figures not only included raids in which the Elliots were a majority, but they included other forays in which the Elliots took a hand, but they were not uh, ringleaders. There was a total of more than 40 of these exclusively Elliott raids. And the total plunder was more than 3,000 cattle stolen, 66 buildings destroyed, 14 men murdered, 146 persons kidnapped and held for ransom, and over 1,000 pounds in cash. One can question who would be more feared, the Elliots of the border or Al Capone and the mob in Chicago? A legal form of raid was the so-called trod. That is the pursuit of one stolen property across the border. 
it enshrined the right, the legal right to recover one's own property by force and in practice to deal with the thieves out of hand. A trod might lawfully be made up to six days after the original offense. If made immediately, it was a hot trod. Otherwise, it was a, quote, cold trod. In either case, the trod was beset with rules so that it could be distinguished from a mere reprisal rate. The 1563 agreement between England and Scotland obliged the pursuer to carry a lighted lance as an indication of an open and peaceful intention. The pursuer was also bound to announce his trod to the first person he met after crossing the border or at the first village and to seek assistance. If the trod was successful and the thieves captured, it was the said that the thieves were caught, quote, red handed and summary justice could be dealt. Uh, students of Highland history are familiar with many of the clan feuds in the Highlands. Um, probably the most famous being between the McDonald's and the Campbell's, best typified by the massacre of Glencoe in 1692. Less publicized, but just as bloody, were the feuds of the border clans. And here's a chart of it, including some of the English border families here, by the way. Looks like everybody dislikes the Kerrs and the Armstrongs. <laughs> Uh, the Elliots don't seem too popular either. Uh, and it wasn't just feuds between Scottish border families, they were cross border feuds. Uh, and the border was surprisingly fluid. The Grams, for example, settled on both sides of the border. The concept of national borders was in practical terms less relevant to border clans than the concept of clan lands. A village would be identified as an Elliot or a Maxwell possession before it would be identified as Scottish or English. Now, perhaps the longest lasting and bloodiest feud was between the Maxwells and the Johnstones. It's not clear exactly how the feud began, but certainly it was part of a rivalry for supremacy in the Scottish Western mar marches. And there was no effective central Scottish government to prevent a head-on collision. As early as 1528, English spies had reported that this feud had turned much of the Western March into a wasteland. An important part of the feud was the question of who controls the Western March ship. The office changed hands between the two families so often. Well, occasionally there was somebody from another family. It was almost always those two. And of course, the English meddled in the feud, supporting one side or the other, depending on how they would advance their own interests. Both families also sought assistance or friendship from the Scottish government, monarchy, to help with put a patina of legality on their clan feud with the other clan. For example, in 1582, the region of Scotland happened to be a cousin of the Johnstones and he quoted a Johnstone as a provost or judge in Dumfries, which was a traditional Maxwell stronghold. But Lord Maxwell, with his clansmen, barred the Johnstone judge to be from entering Dumfries. For this, the regent of Scotland outlawed Lord Maxwell, who responded by leading 400 raiders to the Johnstone, str Johnstone stronghold of Lockwood, sacking it and surrounding the houses. They killed six Johnstones and took another 12 prisoners. The Johnstones struck back by burning the Maxwell village of Duncow. Again responding, Lord Maxwell led a foray, in, foray into Johnstone territory, burning 300 houses and stealing over 3,000 head of cattle. Later, Warden Johnstone himself was captured. Max, Lord Maxwell erected a gallows and promised to hang the warden 
and his fellow prisoners unless the Johnstone Castle of Loch Maven and the clan surrendered to him. They surrendered, that too foul, and Maxwell was now the undisputed master of the Western March, royal apart appointment or not. Johnny Armstrong, called Johnny of Gilnaki, was a famous Scottish border reaver of the powerful Armstrong family. Like his fellow reavers, he raided into England when Scotland was in the ascendancy and would change allegiances as the power shifted. He led a band of 160 men despite having no income from rents. Now this romanticized picture of him and his followers was you know, promoted by the 19th centuries of among others Sir Walter Scott. He operated usually under the protection of Lord Maxwell. Eventually the King of Scotland, James V took personal control of the situation. Armstrong and his men were dealt severely with as rebels. And in 1530, Armstrong was captured. The king had promised him safe conduct, but when Armstrong showed up for a meeting with the king with 50 riders, all splendidly equipped and dressed, King James famously exclaimed, quote, what wants yon knave that a king should have? And immediately arrested him. And amazed Armstrong, proudly complained, I'm but a foot to see grace at a graceless face, but I ha but had I known, sire, that you would take my life this day, I would have lived on the borders in spite of you and King Harry of England, for I know that King Harry would weigh down my best horse with gold to know that I'm being hanged this day. Armstrong was hanged with 36 of his men. One of the famous border ballads is the Ballad of Johnny Armstrong, relating this tale. The variants sometimes open with a lament that it is not safe to appear before the king. Or end with a thanksgiving that as a reaver, Johnny Armstrong had helped keep the Scots out of the English out of Scotland. Perhaps the best known of the Border Reavers is his grandson, Kinmont Willie Armstrong. His first recorded raid was in 1583. Eight years later, he was in charge of a thousand men carrying off over 2000 cattle and 300 pounds in spoils. Armstrong was captured in violation of the Truce Day of 1596. Now on the Truce Day, all those who attended to witness the criminal trials going on on the border were granted safe conduct for that day and until the following sunrise. Ken Mott was not surprisingly a witness to some of these trials, but he, the authorities took him against the safe conduct and imprisoned him in Carlisle Castle. The English warden refused to release him. And the Scottish warden, who was so outraged by the viola English violation of Drew Street, uh, led, a men, led a party of men officially in a raid onto Carlisle and broke Armstrong out of the castle. Now he had inside help from uh, the Grahams and the Carltons who were also outraged by this uh, violation of Drew Street. Well, uh, of course, Queen Elizabeth I of England was outraged by this. King James VI of Scotland, to be later King James I of England, was caught in the middle. He wanted to be on good terms with Queen Elizabeth, but he also recognized the justice of what uh, the Scots had done. Eventually, uh, the Scots uh, warden who broke him out, Walter Scott of Bucklew, had an interview with Queen Elizabeth and afterwards Queen Elizabeth is said to have 
said of Scott, quote, with 10,000 such men, our, our brother in Scotland might shake the firmest throne in Europe. Jed Burger, Jedder Justice. That means justice in which a trial comes after the punishment. <laughs> punishment first, uh, trial later. Sounds like Alice in Wonderland. Now the term hints to Jedburgh, a Scottish border town where in the 17th century, raiders were hanged without trial. They even have a beer named after it, as you can see. Uh, never had it, but it looks pretty good. Eventually, King James VI of Scotland, first of England, set up a commission of 10 men, five Scots and five English, to administer his policy of the borders. Based, based in Carlisle, they were given what was essentially unlimited powers for the border. The unique border law, laws that we talked about a little before were abolished. And the new law was that any Englishman steals in Scotland, or any Scotsman steals in England, any quote goods or cattle amounting to 12 pence, 12 cents, he shall be punished by death. The most blatant offenders were immediately rounded up and served with what is known as jetter justice, summary execution without trial. Uh, Sir George Hume was appointed to spearhead this crusade and he commenced his duties with ruthless efficiency, hanging, quote, 140 of the nimblest and most powerful thieves in all the borders. Now, this is after 1603, when we have a United Kingdom, that's under one king, essentially. Now, the Reavers had endured temporary rough justice in the past, but this time they saw the writing of the hall. Um, and in fact, they started to turn in their fellow reavers to save themselves. The Armstrongs, Elliots, and Grahams were singled out for special attention, many eventually being exiled to Ireland, where they were abandoned and forced to scrape out a living amongst the moors and bogs of Roscommon and Connaught. 150 Grahams were pressed into military service in the Low Countries, the Netherlands, where they served out their days in English army garrisons. Many more were conscripted and sent to the continents to be part of the armies there. And it was stressed that if they came back, they faced the death penalty. Justice was rough on the border. The most common method of execution was hanging. The border is littered with gallows or gallows hills, hangman hills and the like. But beheadings took place and also drowning. At Howick in July of uh, 1562, a batch of 22 reavers was drowned in the Teviot River. Mass hanging took place, but drowning seems to be more popular because it was cheaper. One 1504 account, 1504 account of James IV's executions in Dumfries notes that each hanging costs 13 shillings for the hangman, plus a further eight pennies for the rope. A lot cheaper just to drown them. With the possible exception of the Scottish Highlands, the borders were the last part of Britain to be brought under the rule of law. It was only following the union between England and Scotland in 1603 that a concerted effort was made by King James I or VI to rid the border of reavers. However, between the death of Elizabeth I and the crowning of King James in March, several fa Scottish families launched massive raids into England, claiming to believe that when the monarch dies, the laws of the lands were automatically suspended until the new king was proclaimed. Now the new King James the first or six was justifiably furious. He abolished the old borders commissions and he renamed it the Middle Shires. And by the early 1620s, peace more or less had arrived in the borders, possibly for the first time ever. 
But the borders have given us many famous and interesting people. One of them is James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell, out of the Hepburn clan, Queen Mary's lover and sometimes husband. Technically, he was King of Scotland for a short while. This is a picture of Hermitage Castle, home of the Hepburns. I think you can see how formidable it is with uh, the very high, thick walls and the living quarters and the uh, arrow slots uh, up top there. This is called by some, quote, the most evil castle in Scotland. Perhaps the most famous border Scott was Sir Walter Scott, the great author and chronicler of the borders. He's descended from the Scots of Bucklew, you know, the wardens of the marches in the 1500s. He won fame as a poet, a novelist, but he was also the great chronicler of border legends and lore. His earliest work was an idiosyncratic three volume set of collected ballads of his adopted home region called the minstrelsy of the Scottish border. He is acclaimed as the inventor of the genre of the modern historical novel. And in many ways, Scott's novels and, write, and writings rehabilitated the public, especially the English public's perception of Scotland and its culture, which had been formally believed to be barbaric. Now, we don't think of uh, Robert Burns as a borderer. In fact, he was born in Galloway, which is technically Galloway, which is technically, and lived often in Ayrshire, which was technically not part of the border. But he died in the borders in Dumfries. In the borders today, you have uh, modern border festivals. This is a, a picture of one of them. There's uh, like you have uh, the Scottish Highland Games, you have the Scottish Border Games, essentially, with reenactors. And here you can see some reenactors. Uh, this is from the Howick Weaver Festival of 2018. The border towns also have their traditional town games. And this is a Jetburg Ba game. Now, Ba is, of course, you know, a Scottish uh, abbreviation of ball. It's a form of medieval football. Ba is basically mob or village football, where two parts of a town have, a, have to get a ball to goals on their respective sides. The two sides are called the uppies or the downies, depending on which part of town they are born or otherwise owe allegiance to. The bow must be manhandled and play often takes the form of a moving scrum, which I think you can see from this picture here. The game moves through the town, at times going up alleyways into yards and through streets. Shops and houses in the town border, board up their windows to prevent damage. But unlike traditional mob football, People are thankfully gen generally not hurt by the play. The Scots borders then and now have many famous landmarks. One of them, of course, is the famous Melrose Abbey. Here is Kelso Abbey. This is Floor Castle, homes of the Duke of Roxburgh, the Innes Carr family. You can see how elaborate it is. The Dukes are descended from one of the most famous border reavers, Sir Thomas Carr of Fernihurst, who was made warden of the Middle March. The Carr saga illustrates how clan, border clan leaders, one time reavers, became high government officials and later joined the nobility. The present clan head is Michael Carr, the 13th Marcus of Lothian. This castle was built in 1721. And if you're looking for a fat type, the cars introduced Labrador dogs in 
of Central England and America. Here is the current Duke of Bucklew at his home, Dalkeith Castle. The present Duke is the biggest private landowner in Scotland, owning some 280,000 acres. He heads the clan Scott. He is descended in the direct male line from uh, the Scots who were the wardens of the Middle Marches, and also from an illegitimate son of King Charles II who married him off to the heiress of the Scots of Bucklew. She was described at the time as the greatest heiress in England. Another place to visit is Abbotsford, Sir Walter Scott's home. Um, the inside is filled with Scott's me Scott memorabilia. Probably looks better than today than it did during Sir Walter's time because uh, uh, as he was nearing his end, uh, he had invested in a bad publishing venture and he was just churning out books to earn enough money to, keep, to do the upkeep of Abbotsford. Here's a few of the famous borderers. Uh, by the way, I have a picture of Diana Rigg there. She plays the Duchess of Bucklew in PBS's recent TV series on Queen Victoria. But you have the Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell, the King Consort, the actress Catherine Hepburn, the actress Audrey Hepburn, Sir Alex Douglas Hume, the Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1964, David Hume, the economist, Sir Walter Scott, the author, Neil Armstrong, the astronaut, Sam Elliott, the actor, George C. Scott, the actor, and Civil War General Joe Johnston. By the way, you see the two different spellings of home and Hume. Uh, they are evidently both pronounced Hume. Uh, the story goes that in a early battle, uh, the then uh, Lord Home uh, tried to rally his troops to charge on the same, go home, go home, go home. And evidently, when they all heard that, they all left the battlefield to go home. Uh, so after that, he changed the pronunciation of the name to Hume. Uh, not just famous people, though, but famous brand names. Maxwell House Coffee, Scott's Lawn and Garden, Scott's Towels, Pringles Potato Crisps. The name Pringle has a very interesting origin. It was originally Hop Pringle, H-O-P Pringle. Uh, and in 1408, the, the then head of the Hop Pringles decided to change his name and shorten it to Pringle. Uh, how are we doing on time here? We're pretty close. Um, okay. A little side note here. The Gypsies of Yetholm. In the early 1800s, the Gypsies considered the village of Yetholm in the borders as their base in, the, in Northern Scotland, in England and Northern Scotland. With the nearby border conveniently serving as an escape route, they were harassed by local officials. There are one time perhaps 200 Gypsies in Kirk Yetholm with their own king and queen who lived in a gypsy palace, which still stands. The last gypsy king was crowned in 1898, an event that attracted thousands of spectators to the village of a few hundred people. Today, the descendants of these gypsies are fully integrated into society, and their descendants still live near Yetholm. Well, one last uh, little tidbit, Gretna Green. You may have heard of this phrase before. It's a village and parish in Dumfries and Galloway. It's situated just on the Scottish side of the border. It was historically the first village in Scotland you enter following the old coaching route from London to Edinburgh. Now, Gretna Green is famous for weddings. 
because of a 1754 marriage act passed by the UK Parliament, which prevented couples under the age of 21 from marrying in England or Wales without their parents' consent. As it was still legal in Scotland for couples to marry, even though they were minors without their parents' consent, couples began crossing the border into Scotland and married. Their first stop was the famous blacksmith shop in Gretna Green. And of course, there's a picture of it to this day. There were also provisions to later Act said that in Scotland, you could marry at age 14 if you were a boy and girls at age 12 with or without parental consent. Scottish law also allowed for, quote, irregular marriages, meaning that if a declaration of marriage was made before two witnesses, almost anybody had the authority to conduct the marriage ceremony. The blacksmiths in this shop in Gretna thus became known as, quote, anvil priests. Culminating in one Richard Renison, a blacksmith who performed 5,147 marriage ceremonies. This famous traditional blacksmith shop was opened in 1885 as a visitor attraction. It's still owned by descendants of the blacksmiths who once married people there and remains one of the UK's most popular wedding venues. If you're familiar with Jane Austen's Pride, with Pride and Prejudice, when Lydia Bennett elopes with George Wickham, the, she leaves behind a note to her family stating that their intended des destination is Gretna Green because she was underage and couldn't marry an England without, without uh, her parents' consent. Of course, they're later found to be uh, cohabitating in London. They didn't, they didn't actually uh, visit Gretna Green at all. Well, this, I have a clip of the, board, the best of the Scottish borders here. I suggest, I won't play it. I'll encourage you to take a look at it. It's just three minutes, but it will give you an idea of some of the beauty of the towns and the cities and the palaces that I showed you on some of the stills. If you're looking for a book on the age of the Reavers and the and the border clans, the best book, certainly the most popular book in the United States is called The Steel Bonnets by George MacDonald Frazier. Uh, as I said before, my talk, Frazier is a marvelous author and writer and a border person himself and he knows whereof he speaks. And with that, I'll just say uh, thank you for your attention and thank you for having me today. Bravo, thank you, Bruce. Uh, I think we have some time maybe for a few questions here or something or comments. Uh, let's see if there's any in the chat. Um, Jack, could you take a look at the chats here and see if there's any questions or anybody posts any questions and sure. read them to me perhaps? Um, Looks like Don's got a question right now. Okay, go no, ahead. No questions. This was great. Uh, my family's from Nashville, Tennessee. So we've got John, uh, John Stones. Uh, and my oldest cousin in near Shores High School is uh, a Henderson. We get together all the time. I had no idea he was Scottish, but I should have known it. <laughs> anyway. Well, anyway. Nash Nashville is in Davidson County, and Davidson is often a good Scottish name, too. And we got all kinds of uh, people like that. Anyway, nice talk, really. Well, thank you. Do you like we'll get the Steel Bond okay. book to read? Okay, I, I can recommend it highly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've got a question from uh, Jody Allen. Jody, if you'd like to ask it yourself, but I can read it out. Okay, I, I guess my question, I've done a lot of research because my family is from the Dumfries, um, Kirkubri area, so that's sort of the farthest west of 
uh, in the Western Marsh. Um, my question is, is there sort of a, a myth that um, the Grahams on both sides of the border uh, were rounded up uh, after 1603 and sent to Ulster, uh, Northern Ireland, and um, they were, pro you know, they were promised a lot from King James, but when they got there, what they got was like really not very good land. And so quite a few of them snuck back to the borders. And in order to do that, they supposedly spelled the name Graham backwards, um, creating a new surname. Is there any truth to that? Have you ever read anything or? Or is that just one of those lovely urban myths? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, I have run across that story before, uh, which would, of course, make sense. As you, as you probably know, the name McGregor was uh, banned in Scotland, so they changed their names quite often to Gregory. The, the reversal, I've run across that, especially because I'm also, by the way, a historian of the Chicago White Sox and the 1919 Black Sox scandals. And one of the um, figures in the 1919 Black Sox scandal was a gambler named Billy Maharg. And for many years, people had thought that this guy was a ball, baseball player named Billy Graham, who just reversed his name when he started to do illegal things on betting. Uh, <laughs> but as it turns out, his name really was Maharg. I've done the research on it. His name was Maharg, and he was descended from one of those Grahams who evidently stayed in Ireland at the time. So there is some truth to that story. Thank you. Bruce, I have a, a question. Um, I've tried to research um, Armstrong's, uh, my, my, my forebears. Um, one of them <clears throat> is another John Armstrong, <clears throat> who uh, apparently uh, was a part of the Borders diaspora, uh, or his, his family was, and he, uh, he was in Northern Ireland uh, in the early 1700s, emigrated to uh, the colonies, uh, to Pennsylvania. And he uh, was an engineer. He became, I think he was one of uh, Washington's uh, lieutenants. He was a, a, a general under Washington in the French and Indian War and then was a general uh, under Washington in the revolution. Uh, I believe Armstrong County in Pennsylvania was named after him. I think he was a US Senator. Have you come across him in your, in your studies? Uh, actually, yes, I have. I believe it's John Armstrong you're talking about. Yes. Uh, he was a rebel. He was an officer, I think, during the French and Indian War, but a general yeah. in George yes. Washington's army. Yes. And a, very, very prominent Pennsylvania politician. Um, I won't swear to U.S. Senator, but I could believe it. But um, yeah, and I do believe that Armstrong, Pennsylvania is named after him. Um, so he was, he was a founding father as much as Hugh Mercer or uh, the Reverend Witherspoon and two other Scots-born people who were, uh, you know, instrumental in creating this country. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think the Armstrong, one of the Armstrongs married into the Livingston family. And uh, I'll say one of them was like Secretary of War during the War of 1812 also. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a way up here family. <laughs> Apparently the Armstrongs have fallen into hard times. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, for the, yeah off. just by an amazing coincidence. Yeah. When I taught sociology, one of the things I was trying to teach in my sociology class to students was in social classes, what constitutes upper class versus lower class. And I had a film clip of the, Arms, the leading Armstrong descendant today, you know, in this house that has portraits of, you know, every founding father who, you know, He's descended from all the founding fathers' families and everything, and he doesn't have 10 cents to his name. <laughs> and I asked the class, is this, guy, is this guy upper class or lower class? You know, if you judge by how much money he's got, he certainly is an upper class. But if you judge by his family background, you can't get more upper class. 
this is an interesting dilemma. Well, Julius know, Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar was broke. Their family was broke when they, uh, you know, you know, Julius uh, made his move to get more money and fame for his family again. Well, yeah, good for him. I don't think he was Scottish, like, so. like Armstrong. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We got a question in the chat from Martin. Hey, Martin. Feel like I can read it out. Go ahead and read it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Martin says, uh, "Thank you very much for a very knowledgeable talk. I've learned a lot, and I'm in love with Scotland. Did emigration to America from Scotland lead to lawless raiders and gangs? In America or in Scotland? In America. Okay. Um." Not so much, I don't think so, you know, not so much as I would think. It's, the Scots or Scots-Irish were not known to be the uh, the criminal gangs of early America so much. Um, now, there was a certain amount of frontier living. Uh, as we know, the Scots, especially the Scots-Irish, came a little after the coastal area was settled in the United States, so they had to go into the Shenandoah Mountains and Appalachians, and uh, they were busy fighting Indians. So the fighting part of it probably was not too different from the, what they experienced on the borders if they had a border background. Uh, but um, I've never heard of them being, I never heard of Scottish criminal gangs, you know, roaming Chicago or anything like that. Uh, you know, Bruce, that this prompts me to remember, though, a famous feud in America between the Hatfields and the McCoys, wasn't it? The Hatfields and the McCoys, uh -huh. either in Virginia or West Virginia somewhere. And they well, were yeah, that, that was a very famous feud. In fact, I think Dolly Land has a exhibit, uh, a theme, theme of the I, mean, I suppose you can shoot somebody's pig or something at the, at the theme park. I don't know, but uh, uh, that's 150 years after the families came over, I think. And uh, I don't think the Hatfields were Scottish descended at all. The McCoys yeah. might have a have a connection there. It was started, if memory serve, when uh, it was a dispute over a pig. You know, they somebody found it. I forget whose side they found the pig on, but the Hatfield said, oh, it's in our land, so it's got to be one of our pigs. And the boy said, no, that's one of our pigs. And <laughs> the rest is history, so to speak. Uh, but that, that may be more of a mountain thing than a, a frontier thing where there's not a lot of justice than it is a uh, specifically Scots-Irish or Scottish thing. I don't know about, the, uh, about being bandits, but the Earps are from Monmouth, Illinois. Wyatt Earp and his brothers. Uh, so we had long, I guess they had lawmen on the other side, <laughs> you know, cracking skulls. Oh, well, the, the Earps, yeah, that's a famous family, tombstone and everything. Uh, and later in life, he became a boxing referee and then an advisor to Western films in Hollywood. He lived that long. And he, he was made a boxing referee and nobody pretended, including him, that he knew anything about boxing or refereeing. But the thing is, he would referee with his six gun on his side. And when he made a decision that the round was over, everybody agreed the round was over. You know? <laughs> uh, in those days, boxing, if you, if, you're, if you bet on somebody and your boxer was losing, you get your fellow gamblers to storm the, the, the boxing ring and start a riot and stop the fight so you wouldn't lose your bet. And that's why they employed Wyatt Earp basically as a referee because nobody's gonna do that when Wyatt Earp was around. I'm reading a book right now uh, written by uh, former um, Virginia US Senator uh, Jim Webb called Born Fighting. Uh, he's, uh, his origins are Scots-Irish. Uh, and the, the premise of the book is the, 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 the particular character of Scots-Irish uh, and uh, their, their contentiousness and the impact that that's had on American culture. I see my friend uh, Don is probably listening, but he's not uh, plugged in at the moment. But Don will tell you, uh, and we'll tell you in a future lecture, hopefully, uh, in detail about the impact of the the, the uh, Scots 
in North Carolina, uh, particularly during the revolution, uh, when in North Carolina there wasn't much fight, fighting between the uh, the uh, British regulars and the uh, Continentals, but there were militias on both sides, and dominated <coughs> dominated by the Scots, <coughs> particularly uh, strangely enough by Scots who were uh, who were loyal to the crown. <coughs> you know, having thirty or forty years prior to that, having suffered at the hands of the English. Uh, in, in Scotland, they came over and, and uh, chose to uh, to support uh, to support the crown. So it's an interesting story in North Carolina, and Don will tell you the real story, the full story, at a future meeting, hopefully. Now that's uh, very true. This the part of the Scottish settlement in the 1770s was what's now Fayetteville, it was then Cross Creek. Uh, they formed a militia in 1775 to march down to the coast to meet up with the uh, English Navy and establish a base of Wilmington where they could try and reclaim the colony of North Carolina for the crown. And I think Don uh, mentioned the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge uh, reenactment where uh, the Scots were on one side of the, of the creek and uh, the Patriots were on the other, and they had the bridge in between that they were blocked by the Patriots from getting to Wilmington, and the Patriots had uh, pretty cleverly removed like every other plank from the bridge, so you couldn't check. So the Scots valiantly charged across the bridge to poke their way through, and they got so slowed down by all the holes in the bridge that the that the American Patriots just shot holes in them and uh, basically put down any Scottish loyalty for two or three organized Scottish loyalty until the British army comes back again in 1779. Uh, one of the leaders of the Scottish forces in that Scottish loyalist forces was the husband of Flora MacDonald, lady who had uh, helped Charlie escape. Alan MacDonald. Yeah. 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 And also, also Flora's uh, daughter married Alexander McLeod, who was prominent in the battle. Well, there you go. Uh, um, there were several specifically sort of Scottish units that were raised by the Confederates during the Civil War from the Fayetteville area, including, I think, the 51st North Carolina under Colonel Hector McKethan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you know where they're coming from. But we still have a prominent McLeod in North Carolina. Right, Don? I'm I, I didn't, I didn't catch that. So we, we still have a prominent McLeod in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> there are Jody has not a question. Sure prominent. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, I teach um, border history to authors. And um, I have a long list of, of books on the border. Some are history, some are biographies. And that if anybody would like it, I put my um, email in the chat and just send me an email and I'll send you a PDF of the list. And one of my favorite books, and it's an old book, uh, copyright is 1917. So you probably have to look in a library for it, but it's the highways and byways of the borders. Is this book. And what's really nice about it is it has these um, wonderful illustrations in it and that. And so it adds to it. And um, uh, it's a really a great book. And it's by John and Andrew Lang. And that um, they did this one. And then I also have the one for Galloway as well. So it was a series of books. So uh, depending on where your ancestry is in Scotland, you might find a Byways book for that area. So I just recommend, recommend these. Thank you, Jody. Other questions for Bruce or discussion? Hi, Connie. Hi, Bruce. This is Gus. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I've just pulled over um, and I wanted to let you know that as I've been um, driving, uh, I've been listening to your excellent presentation. I I'm from the borders myself and you taught me several things I didn't know. 
But I literally crossed the border as you were talking. <laughs> and I drove past uh, through Jedburgh, through Far or past Farneyhurst, and I waved. I see Sandy Kerr on the phone. So I waved uh, to Farneyhurst on your behalf, Sandy. I don't know whether Andy's on also, both members of our board. And I shared with uh, Jack, I texted to you, Jack, uh, some photographs that I took of the border as you were talking. So I don't know whether you can share them with everyone, um, both sides, England and Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned... oh, very appropriate. <laughs> Your mention of Ferniehurst uh, reminds me of one of the famous people I don't think I mentioned my famous borders is the actress, Deborah Carr. Ooh, beautiful. Yes. Be beautiful lady, great actress too. Uh, I was just thinking because the King and I, she starred in the movie and they're having a production of the King and I in the Chicago area coming up real soon. So uh, brings back pleasant memories. Bruce, I just uh, thought of something <clears throat> and I don't want to prolong uh, the discussion, but, but um, there is a wonderful song that a lot of you may be familiar with, maybe, maybe not. Um, um, sung by Karen Matheson of, uh, of uh, um, Capra Cayley. It's called Both Sides the Tweed. Anybody familiar with that song? It's a beautiful song that really conveys the, uh, it, the, the sense of this historic antagonism. And uh, it, the message is that, uh, uh, you know, it, it honors those people who uh, are true to their to their family, to their clan, to their cause, and don't and don't um, uh, sell out uh, to uh, to the other side. It's a it's a wonderful song. I recommend it. Well, perhaps we can uh, a, show, the, show the photographs next time, and we'll see if we can't find a copy of the song, and we'll go play that for everybody next time as well. It was written by uh, Dick Gough. Written by Dick Gawkin from Glasgow. Oh he's yeah, he's a, he's a wonderful singer. Fine. Other discussion, other uh, questions for Bruce today? Well, I, in, I didn't mention it earlier, but we are going to have the Scottish Festival and Highland Games this year on Father's Day weekend um, in Itasca on Friday and Saturday. And we're just about to have a uh, festival planning meeting. And I think people are going to start coming into the room in he here at the Heritage Hall on the Caledonia campus. So we probably better uh, wrap up today. But Bruce, I just can't thank you enough for this really fascinating talk. Uh, I think we have a lot of border, a lot of folks on the, on the teams with the border ancestry. And so this has really been a wow presentation for us. So thank you very much for all this new information and, and all of the books. We're all going to get, uh, proceed to eBay immediately after the call and see who can get them first. Um, and Gus, I, I wanna thank you for uh, joining in, even though you're driving in Scotland and uh, thanks for the, for the border uh, review for us. And, and we will try to post those photographs on uh, next month. And Jack, thanks. Thanks again for everything you do. And, and everybody that joined today, um, thank you for joining. I'm hoping you'll join us again next month on June 4th, when we're going to have Dr. James Smythe from the Department of History at the University of Sterling, which is where Gus uh, graduated from the university. And he's returning to us to talk about the reputations of Dr. David Livingstone. And Livingstone, I believe, is a, is a border <laughs> family, Bruce. So, so that's a great segue. Um, so I hope we'll all see you at the uh, Highland Games in June. Jack is managing the games, and, and it's a big responsibility. Uh, we'll be there in all our glory. Um, we're expecting 10 to 20,000 people, so do come out. COVID is behind us, and we'll hope to see you see you there as well. How so on that happy, night, happy note, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Same time, same station. And thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.